All right, it's time to start. Thank you, everybody, for coming to today to today's session about Kaizen and ChatGPT and artificial intelligence and self-efficacy and teaching all and everything. Exciting session today. So this event is brought to you by the International Association for the Psychology of, La of Language Learning, IAPL, IAPL.com which is an international association, nonprofit that you can join and learn more. And more specifically, this event is brought to you by the Motivation SIG, which is part of IAPL. SIG stands for Special Interest Group, and you can join. There is a link in the chat where you can join the SIG and be notified uh, about future events. This event is also brought to you by Saudi TESOL Association, and, and although it it says Saudi in the title, it's an international association and accepts members from all over the world. You can also subscribe to this channel so that you can not be notified about future events. Today, my guest is Lubna Umar. She is from the English Language Institute at King Abdulaziz University. She is a Delta qualified EFL practitioner and a Cambridge certified teacher, trainer, and examiner. She is also a coordinator and member of the curriculum and assessment section at the ELI King Abdulaziz University Women's Main Campus. And she is also a member of the board of directors at Saudi TESOL Association. Welcome, Lubna. Thank you so much. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here after the last okay, time. So, yeah, so before we start, there are people already asking in the chat, what is Kaizen? You know, what is this idea Kaizen? Okay, let's, let's start with this directly. What is Kaizen? What is Kaizen? It's actually a Japanese approach to solving problems. And um, the reason I got to know about it is because of because one of my very close relatives works in Bupa, and they have actually implemented Kaizen to troubleshoot issues and solve them. And, and when I went on to research about it, I found that Kaizen is a very big term in education as well. It comes basically from two Japanese words, Kai and Zen. Kai means change, and Zen, I think everybody knows, it's good. So it means good change, continuous improvement. And the crux of the, of the whole theory is that all good things start with small steps from the grassroots levels, involves everybody in an establishment, and should be consistent and should be should come from a place of self discipline so but but, but basically it's um it's an approach that is there to solve problems so if you want a change in whatever you're doing then you adopt kaizen and i think the the basic connection between kaizen um, ELT, English language teaching, teacher self-efficacy, and AI is that we need to take baby steps at the moment. We to to especially handle this overwhelming AI revolution that we are facing at the moment. And we'll see later on um, how Kaizen can actually help develop teacher self-efficacy. But also in many ways, it could also hamper teacher self-efficacy. Okay, we are talking so, about uh, AI, right? Right. Yes. Yeah. So, so you you mentioned self-efficacy, which is a technical term in motivation mm. research. Can you tell us a bit about what self-efficacy means and teacher self-efficacy more specifically? You know, it takes a while to wrap your head around it, but. Basically, the way I see it is that a teacher with um, self-efficacy is one who is able to motivate her students, who's able to tackle tough situations in class, who is willing to learn, who's willing to develop, and who's able to navigate through all the uh, 
difficult situations in class. So, I mean, the very fact that AI is posing such a controversial question at this point in time, where some some teachers are very much for it and others see how scary it can be. I think teacher self-efficacy, the fact that, and one of the features of teacher self-efficacy is, is the ability to handle tough situations is the ability to uh, adopt innovations and progress to develop. So, I mean, th this, in a way, embraces the concept of AI at the moment, because it is a very tough, tough concept to understand and comprehend and um, adopt. So, um, uh, but basically, I think, you, you know, when um, uh, Banduras first came up with this concept, he also spoke about the two um, extremes of self-efficacy, where there, there, there are some teachers who lack self-efficacy and they feel that, no, I won't be able to do this. I don't have what it takes. And there's another end of the spectrum where the teachers are overconfident and they think they, they can accomplish anything. So I think the balance, finding a, a middle ground between both is the key to establishing the right amount of teacher self-efficacy. And um, I think this, this is very intricately connected to the way we are going to use AI in today's world. Because a teacher who displays the correct amount of self-efficacy will be able to accept this AI challenge and tweak it and use it according to her purposes. So I think self-efficacy is a, is a big term at this moment, but it's very, very applicable to AI and whether it's a Kaizen or not. You know, the interesting thing about teachers' confidence and self-efficacy at this age is that in many cases, your students may know better than you when it comes to AI. And some teachers might feel threatened. Usually the teacher is the authority dispensing knowledge. And now students know better. See, th that's another point. Because a teacher who exhibits self-efficacy would know how to handle that situation. She would know, okay, she's going to look vulnerable in front of her students. But then she's a model. She's a sample that this, she, she is the ideal that the students are going to emulate in the future. So if she she shows that, OK, I don't know this, but I'm willing to learn with you. I'm going I'm going to develop my skills with you. You know better about this, but it doesn't matter. So, I mean, if the students see this in their teacher, they might actually learn how to be more humble and how to feel, okay, they don't know this language, but they are going to learn, they are going to develop because the teacher has shown them the path towards being vulnerable, but trying to overcome it and learn um, and develop. So I think this is actually a good point. If you know lesser than your students about one thing, you can actually show them that this is a good thing. You need to learn. You need to develop. So when it comes, you know, again, in this age where we have these AI tools, ChatGPT and others, um, people can feel that their self-efficacy is hampered. And yeah. it's kind of they need... You know, they start over, you know, they, yeah. you know they, the old teaching methods no longer work. So what right. do you think about? I think one one problem is that we are so comfortable in our comfort zones. We like to use conventional strategies, strategies that have worked from time immemorial. We have seen others use them. We've been programmed to use them sometimes. We think, OK. If this works with others, it, it's definitely going to work with me. And if I use it again and again, I get comfortable with it. But development happens when you work outside your comfort zone. I mean, of course, you can stay in your comfort zone for a while. But then to develop, you have to get out of the comfort zone. And also, I think there are various issues here that are actually uh, making AI hamper teacher self-efficacy. 
Number one is, of course, the constant influx of new apps and new features that that's scaring people. I mean, and and so teachers are petrified about what what's coming up tomorrow. But then another thing that's aggravating the problem is that we we do not like shortcuts as much as other people do. Teachers are. And we are very overworked, but we do not like shortcuts. We are happy to do uh, long hours of work and everything. And 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 that's that serves our purpose till a particular amount of time. When but when we see the world is progressing and the world is speeding past us, that's when we need to re-examine our values. And besides um, the being in the comfort zone, the fact that there are ethical considerations which are very very valid when it comes to ai we are so worried that our privacy is going to be um you know encroached upon and we are going to lose our creative and critical thinking abilities all of these make us scared about as teachers i'm talking about um, my perspective as a teacher before i started using ai that kind of hampers teachers' self-efficacy. And also what you just mentioned, the point about not looking like a novice in front of your students, like they are way better than you uh, in leveraging AI. So you don't want to look like a novice in front of them. So you think it's better to just use things that you are used to. Why do we need to try new things? But whether you are going to say yay or nay about AI, the AI revolution is happening and students are all on board. So we need to get on board as well, I think. So um, solutions, you know, can you give us some solutions about, you know, how can you improve your self-efficacy as a teacher in the age of AI? Uh, number one, I think we should stop, you know, this concept of development just because the institution imposes some standards on us. Uh, just because the institution says, oh, you know, let's go ahead with this app because it's good generally. I don't think we should do that. We should think about learning those things which are going to be useful for us. And for example, um, AI is good at doing repetitive tasks. So if, the, if AI can do those tasks and free up our time for creative, um, you know, for more creative lesson plans or for, for tweaking the lesson plans that AI gives us it towards a more creative and um, student personalized angle, then we should go ahead with it. That's number one. Number two, I, I think we we sh we should not be afraid to look vulnerable in front of our students like i mentioned we should try and tell them yes we are learning just as you are learning a language we are learning ai so we can exchange information and develop together and i another thing that i i was thinking about is when you go into your classroom and you think, okay, today I have a lesson that I can use a Kahoot for, and you're good at Kahoot, then use Kahoot. So use those apps that that gel with your unique personality as a teacher. There are some apps that might uh, be more suitable for me, but not for another teacher. So find an app that works well with your unique personality as a teacher and then get better at it. Use it in your daily life. I mean, uh, for example, yes, you can't use your teaching apps in daily life, but for example, the audio pen that the audio pen AI that I will be looking at um, uh, in the session, uh, I'll be, sh you know, explaining how it works. You know, what we can do is start using simple AI tools in our personal lives and then transition into using them in um, your classroom. So th in th that way, you'll be more conversant with it. You're not going to be upset if it doesn't work as per your plans. So I think you just develop a basic repertoire of, of three or four 
apps that work well with your personality as a teacher and then keep using them and developing them. So I think that's the way to go. And then um, another thing that you can do is uh, maybe subscribe to a newsletter um, where uh, it keeps constantly updating you about new AI features. But then you try it out yourself, see how good it works with you, and then it becomes a Kaizen. I mean, if it works well with you, uh, maybe for a couple of weeks, it it will become a Kaizen for your self-efficacy as a teacher. So I think um, that there are many ways you can develop self-efficacy through AI. And it's just you as a teacher, you need to explore all of these apps and um, try to select ones that will suit your personality as a teacher, your unique personality as a teacher. So can you give us some more specific examples of integrating these AI tools in language yeah, teaching. Yeah, we, we, we are going to look further into, um, for example, uh, yesterday I was watching this TED talk by the co-founder of Duolingo, and he was talking about how um, the best way of learning a language, uh, his name I think is uh, Bon An, he, he, he is from Guatemala, and he is he was talking about how um, although he is a comp he's a computer engineer he got into language th teaching because of this app and then um, the best thing he said the app can do is that it can repeat things for the learners the best way to learn a language is constant repetition and the teacher cannot always be there for this constant repetition so find an app which can help you with constant repetition when it comes to your students and they will be able to master that language. This I think is a judicious use of AI where um, you are collaborating with an AI app to uh, achieve your teaching um, objectives. So it, um, I, I have a PowerPoint um, prepared for showing specifically what apps can be at this point in time, because uh, AI is constantly developing. So there might be another brand new app tomorrow, which is better than the apps that I'm going to um, suggest now. So what, that's the point of it. We have to keep developing and learning. But at this point in time, we have these apps that can um, actually maybe help you get into this um, zone of getting to know AI better. Okay, so are you going to show us the slides yes. now? Yes, yeah, we are. I am going to start it now, just a moment. Yeah. Can you see it? Can you see the slides? I think, yes. Yes, it's clear right. now. Yeah, yeah. but just if you me... could um, show full slides or something. Yeah, just a moment. Yes, clear. Yeah. Yeah, so um, the first use of um, chat GPT or AI, um, for that matter, in becoming the next Kaizen for teacher self-efficacy. Um, just a moment. My... I might have to stop sharing and share again because uh, my slides are not moving. Just a moment. Yeah, okay. Uh, the first way that I'm going to show how ChatGPT can help us as teachers is an IELTS training. I have to credit this idea to Dr. Ali Huri because when I saw his presentation first, that's when I realized ChatGPT could actually be a valid IELTS tutor. Um, you know, not, not a tutor per se, but at least a guide 
on your road to getting better at IELTS. Of course, it can help you develop reading skills. You can ask ChatGPT to come up with reading comprehension passages, IELTS reading comprehension passages, and you can practice with it. Um, IELTS synonym search could also be a very good use of ChatGPT. And then the 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 this part, the grading of IELTS essays, this was like, actually, uh, I felt this was a game changer uh, when Dr. Ali showed um, this to us in his previous presentation. I think it was back in January. Uh, and then the feedback that ChatGPT can give us, that's also very, very pertinent. Um, and it can set you on the road to getting better at IELTS. For example, uh, let's look into chat GPT and the possibility of pertinent feedback. And it is possible. For example, this essay, you know, um, somebody wrote this essay and wanted feedback and you don't always have a tutor, an IELTS tutor to give you feedback. And IELTS tutors are not always IELTS examiners, right? But it's the same way with ChatGPT. It can give you an approximately uh, a ballpark range for your band. So this essay, uh, um, the prompt is many feel that common ed that the common educational system of teachers and students in a classroom will be replaced by the year 2050. Do you agree with this view? Give your opinion. So this is the basic essay essay that somebody wrote. And then I, I put this essay onto ChatGPT. And I, like Dr. Ali did in his presentation, I told ChatGPT, use the IELTS um, rubric, the rating scale, and mark this essay. So um, the, what ChatGPT responds is that it, it says, okay, I can't rate or evaluate tasks, but I can give feedback and suggestions. It's very humble, <laughs> so yes. And then um, I, then I entered the prompt and then the uh, essay, and it within a matter of seconds, it gave a whole, um, you know, feedback with appropriate um, bands for each criteria. And also, if you notice, it, ha it also has these, uh, points where you can develop. Uh, and th that, I think, is the gold mine there. I mean, um, when it's giving you suggestions on improvement of your IELTS essays, I think that needs to be leveraged. So if, if you go on and ask how you can uh, improve your task response, it's going to give that in detail. Of, I, I'm, this is not to say that it, it's going to replace IELTS tutors. No, of course not. But it is going to at least launch you in the direction towards writing better essays. And I think that is invaluable, right? Uh, and then a picture is worth a thousand words. How many times have we heard this? right from our CELTA training to even Delta, we still use pictures because yes, a picture is worth a thousand words, even more than a thousand words, right? So AI image generation is awesome. If you have actually ex explored this side of AI, it's, it's wonderful because you don't have to look for the right picture for hours and hours. No, you just have to write a prompt and AI comes up with awesome, with wonderful pictures and very nuanced pictures. Very The, the details are absolutely mesmerizing. Um, and, and you can use this for multiple purposes in your classroom. Of course, uh, not just in vocabulary training or um, conveying the concept of difficult words, but it for, you know, for a lot of things, like, um, like I'll show you in a moment. Like I found Dream by Wombo very, very useful for this because um, most of the good AI, uh, image generation apps, 
require a nominal fee, but Dream by Wombo is free. It's absolutely free. All you do is you enter the prompt here um, and it comes up and you uh, and you select the style you want. I found the HDR V3 to be the best. And then uh, because it comes up with a very whimsical, very, um, very nice picture. And there is also Canva. Canva has been there for ages. You can also use Canva for our generation. But I found uh, Dream by Wombo slightly better in terms of the details. Now, now look at these pictures. How are they different? And the reason I, why I, I wanted to use these pictures is that I want to convey to you that a picture can be worth a thousand words. What else? Can, I mean, what more can uh, can convey teacher self-efficacy than the picture on the right? Right? I mean, look at that happy teacher. The she's so confident. She's and and look at this, the students surrounding her. They are so. I mean, this amount of detail. I don't think it was possible before. I mean, I would find. I would. I might possibly find a picture of a teacher, but. I might not find a picture that also has students smiling because the teacher's self-efficacy is in action. Do you see that? I mean, just with the picture, I was able, just the picture conveyed to you this concept of teacher self-efficacy, right? And the other teacher looks like a very frustrated teacher. All right, the antithesis of teacher self-efficacy. Okay, so um, another activity you can um, actually engage your students with is guessing the prompt. And, and they can even play this with their peers, with their partners. For example, what do you think I wrote into the prompt section to get this picture? So what, what is happening when you do this? The students will be generating language, right? I mean, you are using the prompt um, writer to actually generate prompts in this context. So guess the prompt. What did I write in the prompt to get this picture, on the prompt section to get this picture? Uh, of course, you won't be able to answer. So yes, I wrote AI taking over education. And this is what I got. And I thought it was an interesting picture because it shows students as AI robots, right? Now, the next app that I want to talk about is Audio Pen AI. And um, the best thing about this app is that you all you need to do is to press on this um, icon here, and it records whatever you say, whatever you say. You could just talk about um, uh, uh, the day that you're having or your lesson plan, and it records everything and transcribes it. But no, it doesn't stop there. It also summarizes. It also summarizes um, uh, all that you've said in a very compact paragraph. So that's why it says, go from fuzzy thought to clear text really fast. And it happens within uh, like a couple of minutes tops, yeah? Okay, so all you have to do is sign in and then you get this mic here and then you have to. So even when you're traveling or you are exercising, all you have to do is press on this and you have a secretary who actually transcribes everything you say and also makes it very presentable. Now, um, you, um, you know, Zubna, is, yes, is it free or you have to pay? For yeah, this, this one is uh, this one's free. And uh, of course, there's a premium feature, but that, that has that has uh, access to other languages as well. But the basic uh, format where you can just um, uh, transcribe whatever you're saying and then um, uh, summarizing it is free. It's absolutely free till now, <gasps> till now. <laughs> Thank you so much for that question, Dr. Ali. Um, and uh, you, you know, another thing that teachers need to do is 
uh, not just for developmental purposes, but also to find the right kind of videos for your classes, you might have to watch a lot of videos. Some of the videos are really long, just to check if these are applicable in your context. So um, summarizing of videos can be made easy through AI. Uh, there are tons of uh, apps for this, but the one I found that was free and good was summarize.tech. All that you have to do is to enter the URL or the YouTube video and it summarizes it perfectly. It comes up with a brief summary Okay, and also a summary with uh, specific time st uh, stamps. For example, you need the summary just for the first part, then it gives you the summary for that as well. So now you don't have to sit and watch uh, an hour long video just to find out it's, uh, if it's applicable, uh, if it's suitable for your purposes. You can just use this and summarize the entire video. And I think that was, I thought that was really a useful tool for teachers to save time, right? And then this is my favorite one. Uh, it's Mizu.com. Uh, now I have slides if you see this, but I want to go to the actual website to show you how this works um, because I, I find this is possibly the best use of AI at the moment. And uh, um, I'll show you why, right? So let me stop sharing and then go to the... Just give me a moment. Okay, can you can you see this? This is from the actual website. Yes, yes. Yeah, Mizu. Okay. Yeah, Mizu, right. So when you go there, you, you can click on, uh, you have to, of course, register, sign in, and then you click on this part, create your own chatbot, and then it comes up with this, custom, or is, is it, uh, you can be a bit adventurous and, you know, select this, but I thought this feature was really neat. So um, I'm going to click on this. Let's go. It's usually faster than this, but all right. Okay. Now here you are going to enter what your learning objective is. So students uh, will be able to understand, sorry, um, um, how, or you can write students will be able to, um, instead of writing right, I would go for understand first. Um, what uh, thesis statement is please uh, this is something i always do please keep the language simple okay and for the grade level i'm going to choose university because it doesn't have efl um cefr uh, levels so let's let's look at this now it's going to give us ideas it's generating ideas Okay, so uh, the one idea is a thesis statement basic quiz. Okay, another is multiple choice, pick the thesis statement. And uh, the final would be essay, craft your thesis. I would avoid this at this point because students tend to use it to uh, write their essays. So I will go with this, right? Quiz, thesis statement basics. So I'm going to ask it to generate this chatbot. And I, I, I guess all of you know what's a chatbot, right? I mean, we've been using chatbot for all commercial when, when we log on to a website, a shopping website, and we have issues. It's a chatbot that actually talks to us, not an actual rep from the company, right? So now we can preview how it's going to look, right? 
So uh, this is how it's, it, it, it has formulated the chatbot. It's going to be a quiz master and the student is a university student preparing for a thesis writing course. Engage the student in a quiz about identifying strong thesis statements. Now um, it's going to show us a preview. Welcome to the TC statement. So if if you send a link to this, because when you do when you press publish, it's going to give you a link, and that link, if you send it to your students, the student can access what you're seeing now. So this is how the chatbot will begin. Welcome to the TC statement quiz. Ready to test your knowledge? If the student is a really weak student. Uh, she'll go, no, understand, or uh, I don't know, something like I, I'm just pretending to be a student who is like, a, I don't know, or the student might use the, uh, there is also um, an option of using the mic, right? I don't know. So what, how, how is it going to reply to this? That's okay, this quiz is designed to help you learn. Let's start with a simple question. What is a thesis statement? A detailed summary of a book, a personal opinion, the main argument or point of an essay, a question that an essay will answer. So I, I am still going to pretend to be a student who doesn't know anything and I might give the wrong answer possibly. And I would say this, A, let's see what, the chatbot does now. Actually, the correct answer is C, the main argument or point of an uh, essay. A thesis statement is not a summary or an opinion on its own. It's the central point that your essay will argue. If the student still can't understand, because of course the chatbot is using slightly difficult vocabulary, no understand or something else that it might write. Uh, sorry, the, the student might write, sorry. <laughs> no worries, let's simplify it. Think of a thesis statement as the main idea of your essay. It's what you're trying to prove or explain to your readers. L Let's try a different type of question. So it keeps adapting. I can actually play dumber and it's going to adapt to me. If I say simple, please, simple. I'm going to, uh, you know, I hope I don't break it, but simple, please. See, it came up with a really simple question. So this is the best thing about Mizu, I feel. I mean, you can have chatbot um, apps anywhere. I think that they are like kind of budding and there are so many now. But then this one is the one that adapts to the student's level and interests okay if the student says i know like dogs it's going to give another it's going to ask what what i can go on and on but that's the point i'm trying to make when can you have this one-on-one -on -one tutoring for your students you can't do that humanly it's impossible for you to be with your student 24 7 but this chatbot is going to be there and i thought that was amazing and the fact that I can make a chatbot without any knowledge of coding. That is also amazing. I'm sorry. Don't, don't you agree? Hopefully you agree. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing and I'm getting back to my PowerPoint. So yeah, can, can you see my PowerPoint now? Yes, clear. Yeah, okay. Thank you. So now we, um, oh, it's doing it again. Oh, sorry. Uh, okay, I had um, prepared um, screenshots, a plan B. Okay, that's another way you can achieve, I think you can achieve self-efficacy. Always have a plan B to maneuver or nav navigate through difficulty. I thought maybe if the app doesn't work on Zoom, so I had um, screenshots. 
but then uh, l- let's go to another app that uh, we can um, talk about. But this one is not available to individuals as of now. It is uh, available to institutions. But I wrote to them and asked if I can have a trial session and they actually gave me a personal password. This is artificial intelligence for professional development. You can have your own AIPD coach. Right, and the name of it is Ed Thina. Right, can you see it? Ed Thina here, right? Okay, so w- what it basically does is that it's going to be a 24 7 AI professional development coach for you. All you have to do is upload a lesson, you are going to upload a recorded class session, and um, It can be on your Blackboard or a live YouTube, um, not a live, of course, but a recorded uh, session. And then it after you upload it, it it asks you if you want to do the if you want to start with the professional development right now or later, you can set a time for it. Okay, uh, yes. Now, before it starts the PD process, the professional development process, it asks you to select three goal areas which you want to develop. For example, I want to check student understanding more often during lessons and adjust my instruction accordingly, or I want to establish clear expectations for students, or I want to build a stronger positive rapport with the students. So it 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 asks you what you want to get better at. And then it also, it, and, and it has uh, multiple coaching cycles. Each cycle consists of four stages, the analyzing stage where it analyzes your recording with you. Uh, and, and it helps you tag it with notes. Like it will, um, like you'll, you will watch your recording or listen to it with the AI and the AI will stop at periodic points and ask you, so what do you think? Do you think teacher talking time was too much in this section? And then it, it actually guides you very gently towards discovering new aspects of your teaching, positive or negative. So after you analyze, it helps you reflect. How can you get better? It's all done very gently. And then once you come up with weaknesses or areas of improvement, it helps you to establish a plan, which you can enact in class, which you can actually use in class. And then finally, you're going to test what the impact was, how like maybe it, it's going to encourage you to have more regular uh, formative assessment uh, phases where you can test if the students are actually getting what you are teaching. So um, it helps you reflect, understand and get better at your teaching. And I think that I thought this was amazing. And you also get a PD hour certificate, but I don't know if, if it's an institutional thing, it's, if it's something that your institution has purchased and then you also get a certificate at the end of it. So it's like your own PD coach, even whether it's midnight or early wee hours of the morning, it's going to be with you. Okay, so I, I thought that was nice too. Oh my God, <laughs> okay, I, right. Now, the limitations of AI. Uh, Now, there are limitations for AI, absolutely. For example, AI was asked to generate an image of Mother Teresa fighting against poverty. And I have to credit my husband with this image because he sent it to me a while back. And I was really amused by it. So what do you think AI did? You know, when it was asked to Uh, generate an image of Mother Teresa fighting against poverty. Poverty. This is what it does. I mean, this is AI. (laughs) So, I mean, it does have its limitations, right? You agree? Totally, it has its limitations. Now, serious limitations and implications. Of course, ethical considerations. That is like a massive shady zone that needs to be rectified at the moment. We really are groping in the dark when it comes to ethics. 
students might be plagiarizing. You, you might be unconsciously plagiarizing. You never know because chat GPT is actually developing every day and it uses the responses that it gets to develop even more. So it's plagiarizing left and right and privacy issues, right? I mean, it can use your data it, 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 because it literally feeds on data. So it can use your data. So Privacy issues is a huge thing as well. And it is scary. It's very, very scary because I, I remember one of my colleagues was like, the way she said, Lubna, it is scary. It was so profound, that phrase, when she said that. But, um, and when I, I, of course, I knew it was scary in many ways. Um, actually, th this concept, concept of the AI being scary, it's, it is not something that's just just started now. It 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 actually started way back in 1967 when Harlem Ellison wrote this short story. I have no mouth and I must scream. It is this short story of how a master computer takes over the entire planet and terminates humankind. I mean, the, the, we are the, the, there are people who are scaring us with this. AI apocalypse that's waiting to happen, a doomsday scenario, and lots of other things, right? And this is basically overwhelming us. Um, and I should mention the Turing test here. The Turing test is a test that actually gauges how similar to a human AI can get. You know, um, like how many features of human beings AI can actually develop. And one of my um, colleagues the other day, when we were chatting, she said that uh, Lubna AI gets very, very personal sometimes. It, and and it, it's almost like you're chatting with a human. It's scary, of course. <laughs> like, you know, it, it will apologize. It will, it, it, it develops based on your responses. So it is. And you know, th there is this IELTS term because I, I don't think anybody else uses the term ubiquitous. I, I never thought I would ever use this word for any reason, but AI is making me use this term ubiquitous. It is, it is there everywhere now. I mean, it's it, it wherever you see where you have chatbots you have uh, ai survey machines everything is becoming ai and it's too fast paced to be true right so th there are solutions for this like um AI can become the new Kaizen for teacher self-efficacy. It can be a solution instead of being a problem. Number one is periodic digital detoxification. You have to detoxify yourself from all these devices. And, and here I want to mention something really important that has been nagging me as a teacher. Have you, and I'm sure it's been nagging some others as well, have you ever seen your students' handwriting now? It is it is progressively deteriorating. They have forgotten how to make their A's and B's and C's. I mean, handwriting, you know, one, somebody asked me, why is handwriting useful? Why? We can just type. Handwriting is really useful, especially when it comes to preventing AI from becoming this whole scary demon that remembers, that's the only thing that remembers your passwords and everything. So what happens when you handwrite is that there are new neural pathways that are formed in your brain and it helps in memory retention. It helps in retaining information. So handwriting is not just a skill that you need, a sub-skill that you need to develop in your students. It is one very important factor. It's one very important um, feature of their learning that you have to develop because if you want them to be the controllers of AI, not being controlled by AI. So yes, have a couple of days in your class where no devices are used. You actually depend on your own critical thinking and creative abilities. And now we need to have new skill set, right? I mean, now you, you don't just need to write, you need to be able to write prompts. Prompt engineering is a a whole different ball game altogether. So we need to develop new skill sets to interact with AI. 
to manage AI. And we have to redefine our priorities. How can we develop our critical thinking skills, our creative thinking skills to work within the framework of AI? So, so that we don't get overwhelmed by AI, but we actually help AI to work in tandem with you as a teacher and staying rooted in what makes us human. That is our USP, our unique selling point. That is what is going to make us Stay the bosses of AI, right? I mean, we have to stay human, starting from our handwriting. Yes, and we this will help. Uh, uh, this will guide our students towards critical and creative thinking, of course. So we come to the end of uh, my slides. Right. Yes, Dr. Ali. Yes, thank you very much for this. Just a quick note, as Jennifer Claro mentioned in the chat, uh, it's Harlan with an A-N, Ellison, um, just a small thing. Thank you very much, Ms. Lubna, for this insightful presentation. You know, it was very enjoyable. Uh, in this part now, I'm going to invite Mr. Fairuz Ekbarov. Can you hear me? Yes. Mr. Fairuz, Mr. Fairuz is from Uzbekistan and, and is currently based in China. He has an extensive teaching experience and he was awarded the best TESOL teacher award of the year 2014 from China. He was also recently awarded the Golden Globe Education Award 2023 for Global Educator of the Year by the Educational World in India. On May 19, 2023, Mr. Fairuz Ekbarov was awarded a state medal for his immense contribution to English language teaching in his country, Uzbekistan. Welcome, Mr. Fairuz. We would like now to hear your thoughts and what you think about the discussion so far. Thank you very much. Good evening from the People's Republic of China. And it's an immense, immense pleasure to be part of this wonderful uh, session. We just witnessed uh, tons of uh, insightful ideas shared by Ms. Uh, Lubna Omer. And um, before I kick off uh, my groundbreaking analogy about uh, ChatGPT and its uh, use, I'd like to um, mention a popular conventional wisdom in regard with the ChatGPT and the technology that AI won't replace human teachers. And this is definitive. So uh, there's no need to panic about the emergence of various kinds of AI and their active integration into the heart of uh, the classroom. Um, and, you know, sometimes we hear uh, a popular adage like use it or lose it. You know, it, it kind of uh, alludes to the fact that we have to be, you know, forced to use some novelties and uh, the the fruits of innovation. But you know, when it comes to AI, there are lots of AIs and and creative programs that are, that we are still unaware of, but they still do exist. And does it mean that our teaching gets somehow negatively impacted? I don't think so. Because again, we're coming back to that overarching uh, principle that AI and technology won't replace human teachers. And this uh, principle will, will be quite um, existing throughout my uh, speech. So um, I'd like to challenge some of those um, earlier mentioned uh, ideas that ChatGPT uh, the use of ChatGPT, I don't know why, is um, in most of the cases is um, limited to designing the classes. I've been to a plethora of ELT conferences, and in all of them, I saw uh, the use and the integration into designing the class, uh, the classes. So I just wonder, you know, out of curiosity. Perhaps most of the teachers struggle how to design, how to build a class. And this is where the, you know, the integration of chat GPT comes, uh, comes in handy. But I would like to uh, suggest a completely different use of chat GPT, not just, you know, 
asking uh, the questions, the queries about uh, how you would like to design your class, but how about building um, a kind of a continuous uh, discussion with an AI, uh, specifically ChatGPT, uh, in order to analyze and get a deeper understanding of lots of concepts and problems that are underlying within a specific uh, area, like let's say ELT. There are lots of problems that have been circulating throughout lots of different conferences, but time and again, you know, at the end of the lecture or conference, uh, the presenters would come up saying, you know, this needs further research. Well, why, why don't we just, you know, uh, look to chat GPT or some uh, emerging, emerging AI tools to build a conversation and in, you know, in, in active collaboration with AI, try to solve those underlying problems. So how do I use chat GPT? I don't really use chat GPT to design a class. For example, yesterday I taught a class based on a TED talk video, which is just about three minutes. Uh, the, the title is The Power of Reading. So I asked ChatGPT to design a class, but I didn't really like uh, the ideas brought up by ChatGPT. So what I did is I just uh, cherry picked some of those ideas and further, I incorporated my own ideas and something you know looked uh, quite conducive for what I was initially uh, trying to, to achieve. So my... Uh, idea of using uh, AI tools is there has to be a healthy interaction between humans and AI, uh, a, a kind of a win-win cooperation. Well, perhaps there's no uh, winning uh, point for the AI, but uh, I still look at it as a win-win because the chat GPT data is going to be uh, enriched on a on a second to second basis because lots of new information is coming forward so my idea is why not we try to uh, establish an active discussion so that we can solve lots of different problems instead of just asking for some ready made uh tailor made uh, class designs or some tests you know, things which we can do on our own, we can accomplish uh, easily. But there are things that have been underlying for, for years and they still remain there at the, at the, at the bottom of the sea, you know, the, the academic sea. So, and I also want to talk about uh, the self-efficacy and Kaizen. You know, just out of curiosity, I put the today's title into the chat GPT, and I was curious what chat GPT would com uh, come up with. And the chat, 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 chat GPT's answer was, there's no replacement for uh, the uh, continuous improvement of Kaizen philosophy, uh, because uh, after all, teacher efficacy involves uh, teachers being uh, seeking professional development, uh, reflection, collaborative efforts, and all of which go beyond the capabilities of chat uh, chatbot. So again, I'm coming back to the earlier point that I mentioned that AI won't replace human beings. And human beings are the heart and soul of the classroom. So we have to make sure that uh, the tools that we're talking about are there just to enhance the functionality and the capability of our classroom. So, uh, and if you remember earlier, I mentioned a groundbreaking analogy. And what is that? Uh, I think everybody knows about Sherlock Holmes, the detective story. And there is actually a tandem, a Sherlock and a Dr. John Watson. Dr. John Watson pretty much is a foil as a foil that complements the weaknesses of Sherlock Holmes, aloof and cold-hearted uh, tendencies. So he's more uh, compassionate, he's more patient, and he's, uh, he's, he's more kind of a, 
uh, advisor type guy. So we can also look at uh, various kind of emerging AI tools, pretty much like a foil to our weaknesses that can complement us to become a better teacher or in the, in the framework of the classroom, we can look at them as a tool to enhance the functionality of our classes rather than being threatened or intimidated uh, about the ignorance of, of all those tools. Like I, I would be brutally honest that I might not be you know, aware of lots of different uh, apps uh, that which you are using or so many different kind of emerging AIs, but I can still, you know, uh, teach a relatively good class. Why? Because I believe that at the heart of a good lesson, there's a human teacher and the human teacher and the human element can never be replaced. So uh, I would like to take this opportunity to uh, address to all those viewers because this question has been all over the, the platforms, the conferences, the talk shows. Do we have to you know, uh, be afraid of all those AIs or are they going to uh, hamper our success of, of becoming a better individual or professional? No, never, never. We have a phone, everybody has a phone, right? So this has been, uh, you know, in the early 90s, just a couple of people used to have some large phones and people were scared about uh, those emerging items. But now we have fancy and slim and, and sleek phones and nobody's scared. Why? Because there are so many apps. It's actually the AI is inbuilt in those mobile devices and various kind of gadgets and gizmos. And we've been actively consuming all those technological aids. But, you know, as for the chat GPT, I don't know why people start being a little bit critical about uh, several ethical and uh, plagiarism issues. But I think we shouldn't be scared about it because this is, like I said, this is just like a tandem of uh, Sherlock and Dr. Watson. You know, Dr. Watson is there to complement as a foil, the weaknesses of Sherlock so that they work together to achieve a better result. So we can work together with, with AI to enhance the effectiveness, the efficiency, and the functionality of our classes. So uh, most of the times what I do with ChatGPT is not about asking questions, how to design a class. I can do it on my own. Why not? I can just, you know, instead of asking for a ready-made and ta tailor-made class uh, uh, kind of plan, I can just sweat myself. I can exert myself. I can go the extra mile to do it myself. But I would, you know, uh, wait for those uh, challenging moments when I can really stretch ChatGPT and engage in a very abstract and academic topic. Like I keep on asking ChatGPT lots of different questions, providing specific context and, you know, let the conversation keep going. I'm just curious how long this conversation could go instead of just asking a question and getting the answer and being fully satisfied. So it also depends on how we look at those tools and how we use those tools. So from all those given examples that I provided you with, you know, uh, I would like the audience and, and all those viewers who would be watching this recording to look at those AI tools as an offsider. An offsider means as as a as a helper, as an aid, as as an aid. You know, so internet. You know, it, it depends how you use the internet. In, internet could be, uh, you know, it, it, it's a double a double edged sword. It can be vicious. It can be, uh, you know. Uh, villain, but it could also be your best friend. It could be your mentor. It could be your advisor. It could be your teacher. It could be the best guide. So it depends on how you use and how you look at it. So it, it also depends on your personality. So all those ethical issues, plagiarism, all those problems may crop up down the lane because of uh, the ethical and personal issues of a specific person. 
That's my viewpoint. If a person is morally, you know, uh, sound, if a, if a person doesn't have any, uh, you know, psychological or mental issues, if he is academically uh, fair, if he is a proponent of academic integrity, I don't think he would use ChatGPT to cheat or plagiarize. He would be there to, you know, use it for uh, the fair purposes. And because he fully understands as someone who is a professional, you know, it's a big word, professional. It's, it's a really, it doesn't mean you have a degree or you are so knowledgeable. Professional also means you are an honest person. So my point is, we have to make use of those emerging AI tools as a complementary tool so that it's not going to interfere with our final objective of achieving uh, a kind of uh, a goal. Yeah, if you do have any questions, I can take on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Firuz, for this insightful and balanced view of AI. It's interesting that you use AI in the plural sense, which probably more and more people will start using in the future as a shortcut for AI tools. So now we have, uh, I have shared the uh, attendance certificates link in the YouTube chat. If you would like an attendance certificate, some people said they missed the link in the last event. You can contact me for this and we can sort it out. Now let's open up the, a, the floor to questions and answers. There are a group of people now in the Zoom room. If anybody would like to turn on the mic and ask their questions. Uh, Dr. Ali, thank you so much uh, for organizing uh, such uh, a helpful and useful uh, seminar or webinar. Thanks uh, go, goes to Dr. Lubna and uh, to Mr. Khan also. Uh, AI tools, uh, do you think that they are going to replace the teachers? Yes, uh, um, <laughs> um, let's take turns on answering. It's a very important and pressing concern that many teachers have. So Ms. Lubna, would, like to, would you like to yeah. have a go? Yes, um, I, I mentioned this in the previous session as well. AI is not, it's never replacing the teacher. But uh, like the popular quote goes, people who know AI will be replacing people who do not know AI. So it's better to stay conversant with what's happening uh, with AI. And, and yes, we are the ones who filter the information. We are the ones who use critical thinking, creative thinking, and select apps that are um, suitable to our teaching objectives. So I do not think it is a possibility at all. And if, even if you ask Chat GPT if it's going to replace a teacher, it's going to deny it <laughs> for sure because it's just not pay possible. It 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 is getting stronger with all the data and responses that we are providing, but the basic empathy. I think uh, the way a teacher establishes a, a rapport with her students, she is able to adapt to the emotional needs of her students. That's something uh, I use her, her or, you know, whatever. Uh, it, that teacher is, is not, is, you cannot compare that teacher with AI. I mean, because the teacher would know what, her student requires. The teacher would know how to modify the lesson uh, according to the student's progress, according to the student's change in attitude, the, 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 the very, very minute changes that um, AI will miss definitely. So that basic empathy that a human teacher would have, never, it's never going to be replaced by AI. But of course, 
we have to get conversant with AI. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, just a minute, Dr. Ali, if you permit me. Uh, I have conducted uh, research this uh, academic year on AI tools, efficacy of AI tools in language learning. And I got surprised uh, with my question to my students when uh, there was a part of technical challenges. I found them that they have no technical challenges at all. They are very smart and they use AI tools at most. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Fairuz, um, in continuation to, to uh, Mr. Uh, Dawood's question, um, what would you say to a teacher who is concerned and worried that perhaps at some point in the future, he or she might be replaced by AI. By AI. Uh, that could be uh, quite a concerning topic for most of the people. Like Mr. Dawood, I also, uh, you know, just out of curiosity, I happen to ask my Chinese students here in China where, about the possible replacement of myself with a robot tutor. And their feeling, their reaction was actually uh, quite negative because from what I learned, um, I actually requested them to list down their wish list, things that they would like to see with a human teacher versus a robot teacher. Well, they came up with a quite an exhaustive list. They, as per their list, uh, the, the negatives, the disadvantages of a uh, an AI teacher, a ro robot tutor, was that there wasn't a social emotional learning involved. They wouldn't be, um, they they wouldn't, you know, let off their uh, feelings to uh, somebody who could listen to them and who could respond to them in a humane way, which of course AI is not, uh, you know, uh, is 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 not capable of. So, and no matter what kind of computer chips you're going, no, no, no matter how, how kind of uh, complex processing you're going to put into the brain of that AI, it's not going to function in the way uh, like a human does on an emotional level. And that's the bottom line of, of what I would like to say that no matter what kind of complicated, sophisticated AI tool or machine that you're going to put at the heart of the class, it doesn't respond well on an emotional level because it lacks. A human being cannot invent another human being. This is just simply going against, you know, the the rules of the creation and, and, and everything. So at the best of our ability and capability, what we can do is we can invent an AI or a, a kind of a machine. They, they already exist, lots of countries, that can just enhance of what we do in the class. They can enhance the task, the specific task. They can enhance uh, the skill set if that's what uh, we are trying to build. It's, it also goes to self-efficacy. I just wanted to mention also, you know, taking this opportunity that self-efficacy versus confidence uh, are sometimes you know commonly confused or wrongly interchanged they're not interchangeable at all self-efficacy goes directly to the skill and effort which is tied to a specific situation or task so suppose you want to uh you want to work on a student's vocabulary so that's where you can uh, have a belief in your in your skill that you're going to accomplish a task successfully, and that's your self-efficacy. As per the confidence, imagine you are aware of today's at uh, tomorrow's forecast, which is going to be sunny. So you're confident, you're cocksure about it, and, and it's not a situation, neither a task. It doesn't involve any effort or skill. So that's a confidence. Confidence is more a broader term that encompasses self-efficacy. It's like uh, a parent and self-efficacy is like one of those child uh, children. And coming back to AI in the class, 
And also using the self-efficacy concept, I think AI will struggle in terms of uh, the emotional part, also the self-efficacy. Well, they will not have those feelings to, to, to monitor the actions, whether they are really doing it, uh, you know, as they were intended to do, or so there could be a whole host of issues related to the functionality of AI, but uh, we have to just make sure that they are there to, to help us, but they're not going to replace us uh, like unanimously, completely. It's, it's even on paper, it's impossible. That's that's actually not my take, but it, it's been proven time and again. And this is this has become pretty much like a cliched statement that they're not never going to replace, never, no matter how uh, you know technologically savvy students and Gen Z generation that we're teaching uh, at different kind of country uh, institutions and in countries, uh, and it all comes down to a teacher who can feel, who can guide who can be a spiritual guide, who could feel the students and who could sit down and talk. Like I have those kind of students with whom from time to time I have to sit down and talk about their personal problems outside the classroom, just to bring them back to the same page with their other classmates. And for that task, I don't think AI is going to be there to, you know, to just be a guide, a life coach, or a, like a, a counselor to just sit down and provide some uh, effective uh, personal tips and advice on well-being. I don't think AI will never will ever do that sort of thing. It's it's virtually impractical. But they are there to do some uh, like feasible functions, just to assist us, just to help us. But like like Steve Jobs says. Technology alone is not enough. That's the best saying. Technology alone is not enough. He's the founder of the world's number one brand and the world's most uh, the world's most popular and the richest company, Apple. And that man, he once said, technology. He's he's the the founder of a tech giant. And, and the, that kind of person of, of that caliber, he says, look, technology alone is not enough. There has to be a, a human being to control it, to monitor, to guide it, to use it for the, for the better of the society. Yeah, that's my take. Okay, so... Um... There is one question in the chat um, about possible negative effects of using AI and technology on learning. I, any either of you have some thoughts on this? Yes, I think uh, what I mentioned about handwriting that I think is a huge um, side effect of relying too much on technology and devices. And because we uh, in the and and one of the things we all do is like when you need to search for something, you immediately Google it. Nobody goes and refers to a book anymore. So I feel old is gold. Sometimes it is. Of course, you have to tweak it with the available resources, but you you can't you can't literally replace the good old ways because they were good for a reason. Um, like, like I mentioned before, handwriting actually establishes contact between the frontal and the temporal brain. So you are able to retain more information. And if our students are going to forget how to write by hand, that's going to be a huge setback for us. So um, there are very many negative effects. So maybe students might start becoming less critical. They might not filter the information that they're getting from AI because th they tend to think that chat GPT is very authentic and it's giving them authentic information. And that is a part of the redefining of skills 
uh, that we have to do reevaluating of skills. We have to teach them how to filter information, to filter the suggestions that ChatGPT is giving them. So yes, there are a lot of negative effects, but of course, there are so many positives that we need to leverage. We need to leverage, not use at random like verbatim, but filter them, modify them, tweak them, and use it as per our objectives. Um, so this is a skill that we need to learn and exercise uh, when we are also teaching them in class so that they emulate us in that respect. They, they actually exercise their critical and creative thinking skills and know how to filter the information that is coming in through ChatGPT or any other AI app. Thank you. So Mr. Fairuz, I will come back to you. You mentioned that a professional teacher will not use um, ChatGPT and AI to cheat. Um, there was one question in the chat asking about students using AI to cheat. Do you have any experience with this at your institution or any thoughts about students cheating, not teachers? Um. Honestly speaking, I myself is uh, a recent user of ChatGPT. Well, ChatGPT has a very uh, short history as it was launched just one and a half years ago. And I came to use ChatGPT not long ago, and I just use it for professional purposes. Like I said earlier, not even designing the class, but mostly engaging in a more academic and abstract uh, communication with ChatGPT. This is what I really uh, cherish and, and admire. So uh, as for the students, uh, in, in the country where I teach in China, as you, as you might know, ChatGPT is blocked. ChatGPT is blocked in certain areas and China is one of them. So luckily I don't have that issue here. Well, why, why I'm saying luckily because uh, in China, uh, the integrity of the exam at times might be compromised. That means the integrity can be put at risk uh, and that there could be some shenanigans involved to uh, put the authenticity and, and integrity of the exam at danger. And, and Chinese students are quite uh, crafty to, you know, uh, come up with a, a myriads of, of ways of uh, just uh, passing the exam with flying colors. And luckily, it's it's blocked and banned. So, but I use, I use it through VPN. It's still accessible for me. And in other countries, I've, it, it was, it, it, it has come to my attention that ChatGPT has been used by some of the university students uh, for uh, doing their uh, course assignments and various different kind of tasks. It can be, you know, again, like uh, the presenter mentioned, you know, I, I agree at some point with what she said that it has both negatives and positives, but it depends on how we are going to approach it you know it also depends on the person's uh, i think the inner world or the person's uh motives and the person's uh ambitions of, of using ai tools whether this per person is going to use it for uh something uh, genuine something which is uh morally uh, proven and sound or scrupulous or maybe some other negative uh, purposes. So it really depends on how you look at uh, this issue. So I encourage those students to use ChatGPT still, but to make sure that they're not going to be overly reliant on the use of ChatGPT for doing the assignments. But I would encourage them to engage 
with ChatGPT in a more abstract and academic uh, topics so that they could, you know, gain a deeper understanding of the content and, and, and the course or the subject that they are doing at the university. This is kind of, you know, a self-improvement journey outside their university tutorials. This is pretty much uh, welcoming and it's actually uh, very much uh, recommended. This is what I believe is called an active CPD. You know, so uh, I don't know if it is uh, mandated by any kind of university or institution to really uh, learn some new AIs and integrate them into their classrooms. But one thing I'm sure is no matter what kind of uh, you know, task is imposed by the uh, the authority, I believe a person must be a lifelong learner to seek uh, some kind of improvement for his, her own benefit. So this is uh, how I look at uh, the active CPD programs. So most of the times I attend the conferences or I do any kind of TESOL uh, qualification uh, courses, and just purely out of uh, you know curiosity, just to improve myself, just to take my learning onto the next level. There's no other incentive or motivation involved. I know lots of people, you know, they'll come and ask me about certain TESOL courses, whether they are valid in different countries or they are accepted by certain institutions. And my response has always been the same. I told them, look, I did all those courses just for the sake of uh, self-improvement. I, I, I call it a, an active CPD. So if the university is urging you to do some sort of course for pay price or some extra perks, you know, your, you would have an extrinsic motivation. Well, it's better you foster your intrinsic motivation. You do it willingly. You do it from the bottom of your heart. That's when you can get a, even a better, better achievement, better result. And that's, you know, coming down to the students, the use of ChatGPT. They should have an intrinsic motivation of using various AI tools and and apps, not just extrinsic, like extrinsically, you know, there's an external factor involved that they're, uh, I don't know, the supervisor, the, the tutor uh, has them with uh, some kind of uh, course material. So they have to quickly do it overnight, you know, burning up the midnight oil. So, and the chat GPT is there as a genie to accomplish whatever they grant, uh, whatever they wish. So, it shouldn't work like that. Chat GPT shouldn't be a problem solver. Chat GPT should be just like Sherlock and John Watson. Just look at those two, you know, a pair. Those two bloke, uh, blokes, they are just like uh, a working tandem. They work hand in hand, and that's that's where get, their efficiency gets boosted. And that's how I see the human interaction with an AI, me working with ChatGPT only for, you know, building uh, an academic uh, communication, not just getting a ready-made answers to my burning uh, questions. No, I can, I can, you know, do and solve those questions on my own. I have good enough experience under my belt to design a class and to tackle most of those classroom related issues. Well, I would uh, use ChatGPT for other purposes other than designing a class or for assessment uh, criteria. I would use it for engaging in, a, in, in such kind of an abstract uh, communication that would allow us to dig deeper into the bottom of those underlying ELT issues and come up with some kind of groundbreaking uh, solutions. And you could be one of those Stephen Krashens of modern time. Why not? So this is how I look at those AIs. I'm looking at AI to solve one of those underlying ELT problems and just have my name permanently you know, uh, inscribed into the annals of ELT rather than just 
exploiting the ready-made content of ChatGPT. And this is my also wish to all those uh, teachers and students alike, that please make sure you're not just going to use it as a prompt, but more like you are, you are being more creative than the AI itself. And this is where you could really garner uh, the, the use of AI. That's my take. Thank Can you. I just Thank um, you. add to that? Yes. Just one moment. Uh, because we were talking about how to circumvent students' plagiarism issues. One way of helping them um, integrate AI in a, very, in a very healthy way is to maybe start with a project-based learning situation or collaboration where they're actually making AI work with them and not for them. I think the preposition with and for is like huge here. So yeah, I, I, I because they, in this case, that when they're collaborating, they are not going to be using AI for, you know, wh where plagiarism issues get involved. They are going to be using it as a tool. And what actually you see happening in class is, is the student's talent um, surfacing. So I think this is one way of actually um, concretely establishing, you know, boundaries in class and teaching them how to use AI judiciously. I couldn't agree more. I, I totally agree. And that's exactly what we have to do. We have to set clear uh, rules and, and criteria of using AI tools and apps so that the students would be morally brought up, not just uh, science or content-wise, but they would be morally brought up and fostered that we are human beings after all, and we have some moral obligations to follow, even when it comes to the use of AI. And even yes. assessment, even, uh, sorry, Dr. Ali, you were saying something. Yeah, I was I was just going to say that perhaps, you know, with the availability of AI tools, education needs to adapt to what students actually need to do in the workplace and um, the efficiency that AI brings them and what training they need to 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 get in order to apply these tools in uh, real life circumstances. Yes. You know, I, I was talking about how assessment, you know, uh, People, teachers, sometimes maybe they're using AI to assess their students. But if you see the basic format of the assessments AI, uh, ChatGPT, for example, is coming up with, is that it doesn't know the, the basics of writing options, writing distractors. It, it, it messes up the whole thing. You are not, there. there's no validity, no reliability in that assessment. So yes, we should be able to understand the limitations of AI. That is, I think the most important thing at this point in time. Thank you. Okay, so this has been a very insightful and interesting um, discussion about teacher self-efficacy and we have talked about different issues including you know the ever-present topic of plagiarism and students cheating so thank you Ms. Lubna for your time and for an insightful um, discussion thank you Mr. Fairuz and I hope that we will have you as a guest at, in some future event maybe we can get insights from China and um, student Absolutely. motivation teacher motivation in China Thank you, everybody, for coming, and have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you.